Greetings and welcome back to Room 303 and uh, our Harvard Classic Lectures on Volume 4. This is lecture number 26, Paradise Lost, book number 12. Hurrah, we've made it. And if you have made it with me to this point, I feel that I really do need to congratulate you. This is, of course, the last book of Paradise Lost, the exile book, the Paradise Lost, uh, at the very conclusion of this book. Adam and Eve will be jettisoned from uh, paradise, from Eden, okay? Now, if you haven't done it, watch uh, my Learn Strong lectures um, uh, at learnstrong.net. Go down on the left-hand side, find the Harvard Classics folder, go ahead and scroll through there. And for sure, for sure, you need to watch uh, lecture number 25 because there's a lot of intel that there, I'm, uh, I say there, I'm not going to go back over it again in detail because the two books originally of 11 and 12 for Milton were actually conjoined. And so because that's the case, we come right back in book 12 to Michael's vision speech where he's talking about the future. Eve is in her dream state induced by uh, Michael. And um, so it's really kind of critical that you're, that you're kind of caught up so that this will make sense to you. But let's just review our levels of reading. What does a text say, level one? What does a text mean, level two? How do I relate to that text, level three? We're also talking, of course, together as Paradise Lost as epic, Paradise Lost as philosophic or theological text, that's that theodicy question, and Paradise Lost as political text, both from its psychological and its sociological rendering. So let's finish. How will Milton end this story? Let's go now quickly to the argument itself, and that's where we'll pick up now. We've been reading these arguments for um, all of the different books, and of course, I think that there's some wonderful poetry embedded right in the argument. And interestingly, in this argument of Book 12, we actually have Milton screwing up, believe it or not. Yes, screwing up. Let's point out just a little subtle way that he kind of misses the mark here in terms of his editing, and he should have probably edited his argument a little cleaner. Reading. The angel Michael continues from the flood to relate what shall succeed. Then, in the mention of Abraham, comes by degrees to explain who that seed of the woman shall be which was promised to Adam and Eve in the fall. His incarnation obviously Jesus Christ, his, uh, his death, resurrection, and ascension, the state of the church till his second coming. Adam, greatly satisfied and recomforted by these revelations, I'm sorry, these relations and promises, descends the hill with Michael, awakens Eve. We're going to point out that actually at the very conclusion, Eve will be already awake when they return. Little subtle screw up there who all this while had slept, but with gentle dreams composed to quietness of mind and submission, back to the patriarchal ideas of Milton, Michael in either hand leads them out of paradise, the fiery sword waving behind them, and the cherubim taking their stations to guard the place. I should point out, there are just so many relations that we're constantly making. Remember, we define learning as connecting new to old. One of those connections is that passage that we study together from um, Walt Whitman's Song of Myself, passage 46, when he says it, I take you to a hill and I show you the landscape. Not I, not anyone can travel that road for you. You must travel it for yourself. Well, that game that Whitman is playing is borrowed in some ways from these, uh, th this passage of uh, this, the, these two books of, of 11 and 12, where Michael is kind of showing Adam the future. Let's do a brief plot summary, because we like to do this for uh, you at the beginning of each of the books. Three parts, really simple. A, Michael's vision summary is going of history is going to come to its uh, conclusion. B, they're going to return off of the mountain that they are on to Eve. And then finally, Adam and Eve will leave paradise together hand in hand. We'll get to those lines. All right, let's open. And as I've said about every one of these lectures, I, I enjoy repeating myself to say it this way at least. Um, I wish I could read every line of this with you. If I could, I would. I don't have the time, uh, but I'll do my best here. Let's read the opening 12 lines. As one who in his journey baits at noon, though bent on speed, so here the archangel paused betwixt the world destroyed and world restored, the, the conclusion of the, of the Noahic flood. So we have the flood of Noah 
and of course then the world has to be restored again. If Adam ought perhaps might interpose, then with transition sweet, new speech resumes. Thus thou hast seen one world begin and end, and man as from a second stock proceed. Much hast thou yet to see, Michael obviously speaking to Adam. But I perceive thy mortal sight to fail. Objects divine must needs impair and weary human sense. Henceforth, what is to come I will relate. Thou therefore give due audience and attend. That is to say, listen. I'm now going to continue my story after the flood. Where Milton goes is fascinating, and especially some of, the, some of the people that he decides to emphasize. For example, at line 25 and at line 33, although not named, we get this very interesting and enigmatic figure named Nimrod. Um, you can read it uh, about it in Genesis 10.9, a mighty hunter who turns into a tyrant and is also the founder of Babel, that Tower of Babel that is going to um, uh, be explained in the Bible as the attempt to somehow try and reach God, probably a ziggurat of a kind of the Mesopotamian area or region. Um, but we're going to have the founder of this Babel at line 45. By the way, there's some interesting stuff um, from Josephus about this, a famous Jewish historian. At line 53, of course, you're going to have the confusion of the languages at line, uh, at line uh, 53 and following. A hideous gabble arouses, and of course, we immediately think about the hissing that happened uh, in, in, early, in the earlier book, of course, when, Adam, or, uh, when Satan returns back to hell and, uh, and starts his, his whole gig there um, in, in book 10. Um, of course, again, let's say it, Milton, this amazing linguist, never seems to want to get around to the question, what was the original language from which all of these other languages splay out? At uh, line 83, and again, Michael is just kind of summarizing history as we go, and he talks about true liberty being lost. After the flood, things begin to degenerate again. At line 83, which always with right reason dwells, twined, and from her hath no individual being, Reason in man obscured or not obeyed, immediately inordinate desires, um, and then just to finish this line, and upstart passions catch the government from reason, and to servitude reduce man till then free. I just want to point out for a moment that it's very hard to read Milton if you haven't read Plato. And especially my lectures on Republic now, I'm going to recommend to you. Because when Milton is playing this game, what he is doing is he's playing a very Platonist game from, of course, Republic, where Milton or Plato will argue through Socrates that the tripartite soul, the well-governed soul, is a three-part governance where reason, wisdom, is going to be controlled, be controlling. Um, the emotions and the desires, and we even maybe you'll remember on the whiteboard, we put this in the form of a pyramid where you're going to have this kind of thing happening. Now, if reason is somehow usurped by emotion and desire, then you are going to have a declension. And in Bible 8 and 9 of Republic, we of course have that famous declension of state idea where you have three parts to the building of a society. It's beginning A, it's ascension B on the hill. We have this on the whiteboard for those of you who can remember. And then finally on the other side, that declension, the descending, the C. And, 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 and in Milton, by um, line uh, 97, nations will decline so low from virtue, which is reason, that no wrong but justice and some fatal cause annex deprives them of their outward liberty, their inward lost. Again, another paradise loss, right? Okay. Um, I should point out, by the way, that Milton will be following in a tradition that will politically say, we used to be much better than we were. We are declining nations will decline. And often that decline is associated with a loss of freedom, but a certain kind of understanding of freedom, and it is that tension between freedom meaning liberty to do whatever I want, and freedom meaning that you somehow govern your needs and desires for the greater good. 
by uh, line 111, we're told that out of all of this uh, chaos, one particular nation to select from all the rest of whom to be invoked, a nation from one faithful man, and of course we're talking now here Abraham. Um, uh, we have a bit more showing off that will happen between lines 112 and 152. I mentioned this in the earlier lecture when I, I played it out as, hey mom, Milton's showing off again. Milton cannot, cannot help but impress upon you just how brilliant a scholar he is. But by, the, by, by 152, we have Abraham, the faithful Abraham, and of course the idea here is following in the history of biblical uh, text. Abraham will be the father of a great nation of people that will, of course, ultimately provide us with Jesus Christ. And this will be Milton's theodicy and his theology as, of course, a, a, a Puritan Christian. At line 175, we have the slaves. Of course, we have the plagues of Exodus 6 through 15. And, of course, the Exodus itself at line 189. We have the notion of the firstborn that will happen. And the firstborn of Egypt must lie dead. We made this observation in our comments in book, uh, book two earlier. Um, it's interesting that this notion of killing the firstborn by God is for Milton acceptable because God does it, but of course when others like uh, um, uh, other demon gods or whatever do it, of course it's inappropriate. At line 227 we have the mention of Mount Sinai. Of course we're going back to book one and the invocation. Note the invocation is that shepherd of book one, the, um, which is of course Moses attributed to be the, the author of the book of Genesis. And of course here on Mount Sinai we have Moses who will have led the people out of the bondage of Egypt and then ultimately to Mount Sinai for the giving of the laws uh, uh, of the Ten Commandments as we know them. At line 235 we have an interesting idea. To the, but the voice of God to mortal ear is dreadful. Notice the shift. When God's voice before the fall was being shared with Adam, that was a good thing, not a dreadful thing. Now, of course, it's a fearful thing. At line, 260, at line 261, we have the continuation of the history. How many battles were fought? Um, at line 261, how many kings destroyed and kingdoms won? Um, well, we're talking here, of course, about those uh, those battles in Joshua, just to go to one of them, the book of Joshua, 11 verses 11, for example, um, it, again, I guess um, to point it out, it's okay when we destroy every living thing, including children and women, um, uh, in the Joshua 11, 11 passage. It's okay if God does it. Interestingly, as well mentioned at line 263, is the notion of the sun standing skull. This is, of course, in one of those famous battles, Joshua 10, 12 through 14, which does beg the question, what would Galileo have said about Milton's suggesting that the sun stood, stood still? It's a, it's a fun question to ask. Line 293, after all of this, we're told that we have to have a, um, a, a, um, a sacrifice. Um, uh, th when, when they see, lock, and discover sin, but not remove, say by those sh uh, shadowy exp um, expiations weak, the blood of bulls and goats, they may conclude some blood more precious must be paid for man, just for unjust, that in such righteousness to them by faith imputed they may find justification towards God in peace of conscience. And of course, this is the suggestion of the need for the sacrifice of Christ. We've already, of course, been set up for this in Paradise Lost Book 3, in many ways, and I think this is important to say, many people feel like books uh, 10 and 11, or, I'm sorry, 11 and 12 of Paradise Lost are kind of a tack on. I don't think so at all. I think Milton is uh, well aware that to justify the ways of God to men, and he says it right there in the opening lines of the invocation, he has to be able to say something about his Christian theology and the need for Christ to come and redeem all of the world. So it makes sense. At line 302, we have a better covenant. This, of course, will be the Christian New Testament as opposed to the Hebrew Old Testament or Old Covenant. At line 348, um, the uh, notion of the return back to Babylon and the, and um, well, first of all, we've got the three kings that will be mentioned here of Saul, David, and Solomon, and then in 586, the Babylonian exile. For those of us who love the study, of course, of biblical text, we realize how important that Babylonian exile was of 586. Once Jerusalem falls, once the temple is destroyed, the obvious question is, how can a people relate to their God? 
How can covenant be understood? And the answer, and it's a brilliant answer, is of course a textual answer. I've given uh, these observations in other lectures, but I'll just mention it again, that coming out of 586 and that exile, what happens? The collection of religious and sacred texts, the redaction of those texts, obviously the influence as well of some Babylonian texts. We think of the Epic of Gilgamesh, don't we? For example, the story of Noah and the Flood. By line 360, we have the birth of Christ with, of course, this, uh, yet at his birth a star unseen before in heaven proclaims and come, guides the eastern sages, the Magi. At line 368, of course, we have the virgin uh, referenced here, um, the second Eve, Mary herself. By line 379, we have the reference of Luke 1, 31 through 35, and of course the virgin mother, Hail. We have several moments that Milton will do this Hail thing, and here he does it at line 379. At 386, we have Milton's uh, little sermon that will, uh, that will um, culminate at the, um, with... Um, the uh, um, bashing of, of Jews uh, when he says it at line 414, uh, a shameful and accursed uh, the, the, uh, that Christ is nailed to the cross by his own nation, slain for bringing life. And of course, uh, those of us who like to make these distinctions point out that of course Romans killed Jesus Christ, Jews did not. Of course it's going to be a rendering and a reading of the New Testament and much of the parts of the New Testament that a lot of Jew blaming is going to happen and this is of course necessary for any number of theological reasons that we won't get into here. Finally at 5, uh, 4, uh, 51. Um, we have then the end of all of this. Let's, lead, let's read it. Then to the heaven of heavens he shall ascend with glory. Michael obviously talking about the end. Triumphing up through the air over his foes and thine. There shall surprise the serpent, prince of air, and drag him in chains through all his realm and there confounded leave. Then enter into glory and resume his seat at God's right hand, exalted high above all names in heaven, and thence shall come when this world's dissolution shall be ripe with glory and power to judge both quick and dead, to judge the unfaithful dead, but to reward his faithful and receive them into bliss. It's ironic that the word bliss is used here since again, as we pointed out in an earlier lecture, that's the last word Satan uses before he gets turned along with all the uh, demons into snakes. Into snakes. Um, um, into bliss, whether in heaven or hell, for then the earth shall be, shall all be paradise, far happier place than this of Eden, and far happier days, uh, ending at line 465. Um, of course, so the archangel Michael then paused, as at the world's great period, and our sire Adam, replete with joy and wonder, thus replied, oh, starting at line 469, oh, goodness infinite, goodness immense, that all this good of evil shall produce, and evil turn to good more wonderful than that which by creation first brought forth light out of darkness. Full of doubt I stand whether I should repent me now of sin, by me done and occasioned, or rejoice much more, that much more good thereof shall spring. To God more glory, more goodwill to men from God. And over wrath grace shall abound. Now this is an interesting idea that, in other words, out of all of this terrible stuff, good will come. It's one of the major themes, of course, of Paradise Lost, and of course it's one of the major and important ideas here. Well, at line 508, uh, Michael continues with his future prophecies, and he says that ultimately the wolves are going to come. The wolves are the bad, of course, preachers or bad religious. We think, of course, of Acts, uh, of Acts chapter 20, verse 29. That's exactly where this verse comes from. And we think, of course, of Chaucer's um, condemnation of church hypocrisy, going back to some earlier lectures that I gave on Chaucer. By 537... The world goes on, we are told, so shall the world gold go on. There will be groaning involved, and by 546 there will be judgment involved because Satan with his perverted world will then raise from the conflagrant mass purged and refined new heavens, new earth, ages of endless date founded in righteousness and peace and love to bring forth fruits, joy, and eternal bliss. Again, back to this word of bliss at, five, uh, at 546. 552, Adam speaks. And at 561, 
he is ready to make his observation. Henceforth, I learn to obey, I learn that to obey is best and love with fear the only God. To walk as in his presence, ever to observe his providence, and on him soul depend. These are all the things Adam says that he has now learned. Of course, this will be an articulation as well as Milton and Puritan theology. Merciful over all his works with good still overcoming evil, and by small accomplishing great things, by things deemed weak, subverting worldly strong and worldly wise, by simply weak, meek, that suffering for truth's sake is fortitude to highest victory and to the faithful death, the gate of life. Taught this by his example, whom I now acknowledge my Redeemer ever blessed. Reads, of course, kind of like a, uh, kind of like a prayer song. Uh, let's point out, by the way, the idea, and this is part of Milton's theodicy, that suffering is propedeutic. In other words, it teaches us something. It's didactic. To continue now at lines uh, 574, uh, to whom um, thus also the angel last replied. So Michael is going to reply one more time. Thus, having learned, he's going to point out that knowledge is not enough. You have to have deeds as well. Thus, having learned, thou hast attained the sum of wisdom. Hope no higher. Though all the stars thou knewest by name, and all the, uh, and all the ethereal powers, all secrets of the deep, all nature's works, or works of God in heaven, air, earth, or sea, and all the riches of this world and joys, and all the rule, one empire, only add deeds to thy knowledge answerable, add faith, add virtue, patience, temperance, add love. By the way, just point out, the number of times love appears in this book, that's significant. We, we don't hear the word love used a lot by Milton until the very end of Paradise Lost. By name to come, called charity. We think of 1 Corinthians 15, the famous chapter in 1611 uh, version of the Bible, charity. The soul of all the rest.